I'm Shilta Hegde Ingram. Thank you for joining today's briefing on Target Early. As we've done with past briefings, we will start out with a short presentation from Target Smart Senior Advisor, Tom Bonnier, followed by a Q&A session. Uh, during that time, you'll be able to submit written questions or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, and we will also be recording today's session. So we will have that available if folks need it after. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Tom. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks y'all for coming. Good morning. Uh, so I'm excited to share this tool, uh, the Target Early tool, tool. For those of you who have been following uh, the early vote data for cycles, you know that this tool has actually been around going back to, I believe, 2018. Uh, it's a resource that our team at Target Smart has been putting out into the community. We believe that more information is a good thing. And so I'm going to share the tool. There are a lot of exciting changes to the tool this year that I'd like to uh, talk through with everyone. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to take one minute to just talk about early vote analysis, just to make sure that we sort of level set. Uh, we're big believers, obviously, in the value of the early vote data that we are collecting in real time in providing more information about the electorate and giving us a better sense of where things potentially are headed. But to be clear, early vote data is not going to tell us who is going to win this, this election. It will fill in some of the gaps. And so to the extent that the polling data gives us good information on potentially how people are voting or how areas of geography are voting, but really lacks information about who is voting, the early vote data gives us maybe half of the answer to the question of who's voting, remembering that in 2020, over 100 million people voted before Election Day, 64% of the electorate. Uh, and this year, though, we anticipate that the early vote share of the total vote will be significantly less than 64%. We have to keep in mind that in 2020, the election happened during a pandemic. There was more open ballot access in many states uh, than we have right now. Uh, and frankly, Donald Trump convinced his supporters that voting by mail was some sort of form of fraud. Uh, so we do anticipate some changes in the early vote. Uh, and I'll talk about that more as we get into the actual tool and talk about some state analysis. Uh, but we have to keep that in mind. It's not going to, in the end, tell us what we all want to know, I'm sure, which is who's going to win, but it's going to give us a lot more data uh, and a lot more certainty about where things are headed than we would have without it. So with that, I'm going to screen share here and I'm going to show you the tool. Uh, and I will just take a few minutes to walk through. I'm not going to walk through everything again, as, as I have with our other tools that we put out in the public domain in the past, I encourage everyone to, uh, to use it, uh, and to explore it yourselves. Uh, but if I'll click into this 2024 tool, it's going to start you on the national page. Uh, I will say national early vote analysis. It's not something that I think uh, you can draw a ton from because it's the aggregate of so many different data sets from different states that have started their early voting at different times, but perhaps you might find some utility in this. What I would encourage people to do as you're using this tool is to dig into some of the smaller units of geography. So obviously we have states and I'll show you a state geography in a moment. But we also have battleground aggregates, in this case, uh, for the presidential battleground in the United States Senate. You'll see here at the top, it's going to tell you when this was most recently updated. Uh, it's updated at least once a day. Um, I believe at some point soon, it may be updated twice a day. It might have happened already. Uh, it'll tell you how many votes have been cast so far, at least that have been reported back to our team. Again, our team is collecting this information basically real time from the states. So you're getting a lot of votes counted in here, telling you what percent of the 2020 turnout is already reported. And they'll tell you which states are in here. In this case, the seven traditional battleground states. Uh, for the sake of going through this tool, I'm going to pick a single state. Uh, and since I've a lot of these demos, I've used uh, North Carolina, I'm going to pick on a different state and use Michigan this time. So it's a state I've been looking at a lot more recently. And what you'll see here is it starts with uh, a comparison of the early vote data 
uh, thus far by gender. Now you'll see here, you see larger numbers in 2020 and 2022. This is because the comparison that's selected is looking for the total early vote. So that's saying that in Michigan, almost 3.3 million votes were cast before election day. So we're going to change this to the current date in time, which is actually this up update went through uh, in the middle of the night. There'll be an update coming out soon that will roll it out for the 21 day update. Uh, but here we are. Uh, and now it's comparing how many votes were cast at this same time. So again, you see about 1.1 million votes were cast in Michigan up to this point in 2020, uh, 600,000 at this point now, and in 2022, 465,000. Now, again, we have to keep in mind, like I said before, uh, there have been changes in terms of ballot access. Michigan is actually adding early in person that will be starting promptly. Um, but also you're seeing a lot of more COVID conscious Democrats from 2020, especially younger voters who are expected to pivot back to election day voting, which is why you see the smaller number. But the comparison here that it defaults to is a comparison by uh, gender. And so you'll see here again, I'm not going to go through the, the full analysis at this moment. I'd be happy to do that after I show you all the tool. But you see the gender gap. It's actually slightly bigger. Uh, this year than it was at this point in 2020, and it's even bigger than it was in 2022, which is pretty remarkable as an aside, uh, given that the abortion rights amendment was on the ballot in 2022, and we had massive gender gaps in, in Michigan during that election. Now, you have the ability to select a lot of different data points here. Party registration, which is not something in Michigan, but states that have it, you can look at the breakdown by party registration. Uh, you can look at vote frequency, and this is something that I think is important because when we think about the early voting data and how it is predictive, well, there's certain elements of this that we have to consider. One is, you know, people will say that isn't the early vote just cannibalizing the election day vote, meaning aren't we just seeing people who would have voted on election day voting early? And is that indicative of, of intensity and enthusiasm? Uh, and again, we can dig deeper into that question uh, in a moment, but this will allow you to look at breakdowns by these different groups. So super voters being those voters who um, who vote most habitually, most often. And so you see here, there's actually an even bigger gender gap among the super voters than there are among the infrequent voters. But we can even look just down at first time voters or infrequent voters. You can select however you want. Um, we can look at age, race, marital status, so on and so forth. I'm not going to walk you through all of these, but to get a sense, there are all these different tools that we can look at. So here, if we look at race, we see that black voters in Michigan are turning out a much higher rate in terms of their share of the electorate than they did in 2020 or 2022. And a cool thing here is we can dig deeper into any group. If we want to look at, well, what's the age distribution among these Black voters who have voted already in Michigan, we can look at the gender. And again, we see a bigger gender gap. I'm going to look at age. And we can see here that uh, at least relative to 2020, you see uh, this vote skewing older in 2024. Um, we could jump in and you can add up to three different variables here. So I could look at these uh, older voters. And again, you see bigger gender gaps among these older black women who have um, voted. So um, one more or two, two, maybe two more functions I want to highlight quickly. Then I'll talk a little bit about analysis. And then again, I'd like to open up to any questions folks have. One uh, addition that our team made that I'm super excited about um, is this 2020 vote mode toggle. Um, because again, as I said, we do anticipate that you're seeing sort of a bi-directional trend happening where you're going to see more Democrats, especially younger Democrats who voted early in 2020, go back to voting on election day in 2024 because COVID is no longer a concern for many of them. Whereas you're seeing Republicans put a substantial effort into converting more of their election day voters back to early voting. And while you're not seeing that as much here in Michigan, you are seeing it in other states that we can talk about. So to be able to see if that is indeed what is happening, 
you can just toggle that on and now you can look at this and it will show you what share of the people who voted already uh, voted on election day. So in this case, among white voters who have voted in 2024 in Michigan already, 7% of them voted on election day. Now, what'll be interesting is if we move to modeled partisanship, and I do want to pause for a second here. If you select modeled partisanship uh, in the tool, you're going to see this pop-up box. Um, this exists for a reason. Like I said, we have party registration uh, in states where they have it. Michigan is not one of those states. But across every state, we have model partisanship. It is a model our team at Target Smart builds that is predicting the probability that someone would identify as a Democrat, Republican, other. Effectively, what it is is a zero to 100 score. And then the team creates a classification out of it. So it groups everyone into Democrat, Republican, or unaffiliated based on uh, this model. A couple important things to keep in mind, and it's all, all in this. So I'm not going to read everything here for you, but just the, the highlights. This is not intended to predict Harris or Trump support. Think of it more like partisan registration, where we know crossover does exist. Another important element here is while this partisan model allows you to compare just like all of the other data points across multiple election cycles, this model is updated by our team on an annual basis. They are always working to improve it, to improve its accuracy, and also just to reflect the partisan trends in the country. So comparing 2024 model partisanship to 2020 isn't the most valid possible comparison, but we still include it in here because we do believe there is value to it. But there is a danger in looking at the gaps in partisan uh, turnout and concluding that that actually uh, depicts an advantage for one side or the other. But here we are. So now if we look at modeled Republicans who have voted, we can see that 10% of the modeled Republicans who voted already voted on election day uh, in 2020, whereas only 4.6% of modeled Democrats voted on election day. So again, it was the trend that we predicted that would happen a few weeks ago when we wrote about this um, is happening. In fact, it's happening even more. We've likely heard more about this in Virginia we can go to Virginia here, you see this, it's more stark. And we know in Virginia, Governor Yunkin invested over $10 million, I believe $13 million to convert election day voters to early voters in the 2023 elections. They did that with success in terms of moving the voters, in terms of the success they had in an electoral perspective, perhaps less so. This was probably more likely this cannibalization of election day votes that we're talking about. So here in Virginia, almost one in four modeled Republicans who have voted already voted on election day. Again, uh, less than 9% of Democrats. So you're saying, seeing that asymmetrical distribution of, um, of this early vote. What I'm really interested in here is how many of the people who voted early didn't vote in 2020. And so you can actually look at this here. You can see that only 2.3% of the Republican early voters were registered in 2020 and didn't vote, and 3.8% were unregistered, period, whereas 4.5% of Democrats um, who have voted already weren't registered to vote. So you actually see an advantage in this case in terms of that perspective that Democrats are turning out more new voters in the early vote, which in the end, when we think of the early vote, and we think of our historical analysis here, where we found more value in predicting intensity, which is the question we're all trying to answer at this point, which side has more engagement, intensity and enthusiasm heading into election day. Early vote can be a good indicator of that, but it's generally only when we're limiting ourselves to looking at these infrequent voters, these first time voters, or uh, new registrants, people who didn't vote in 2020, there's actually a tool here. You can look at this, vote in 2020, and you can select um, the breakdown there and see, look at just the people who didn't vote. And you see here where Democrats have that advantage. They have a five-point advantage in Virginia among people uh, who didn't vote in 2020. Um, there are other things that we can look at here. I guess the last point that I'll make, uh, and then um we'll pause is this is all looking at vote shares you can also look at turnout percents 
So this is looking at what percent of registered voters in this group have voted already. So it's telling you that in Virginia, uh, and we'll move this off here. In Virginia, 11.6% of women who are registered to vote have voted already and 10.7% of men. Um, especially when we're thinking about the partisanship, like I said, the partisan model moves around from year to year. Uh, so comparing the shares isn't necessarily the most valid comparison, but looking at the turnout percent will give you something perhaps a little bit more helpful. So you see here again in Virginia that, uh, the democratic turnout 12.6% Republican is 11.7%. So again, there's a lot more we could go into in this tool, but I wanted to make sure we have time for questions here. Uh, hopefully this gives you a good overview of the tool, um, how it works. And again, I encourage people to get in, to play around with it, to use it. And I'm confident when you do, you'll find some helpful information. Uh, so I'd love to take questions. I do, as folks are, uh, you, I think you can just raise your hand or put them in the Q and A uh, and Shilpa will take questions um, and, and pass them on. Um, I do want to give a shout out to our team at target smart. None of this is possible without the incredible work they do, starting with the data. Uh, they build the best voter file in the business. It is the most frequently updated voter file anywhere on either side of the aisle, uh, literally, uh, several hundred updates over the course of the year. Uh, and so, like I said, this early vote data is streaming in, in real time, uh, beyond the sort of obvious, what we've talked about here in the analytic utility, um, the more important element of this is the way that they're able to service our clients and most importantly, make sure that they're not spending money communicating with these people who have already voted. Um, so I want to give them credit for that. The team that built all the models that are reflected in this do incredible work. And then the team that actually built this tool and continues to maintain it. It is an incredible thing. And the fact that this is something that is made available to the public uh, with this historical context, there's nothing like it out there. Uh, and I, I want to express my gratitude for the work they've done to uh, continue to improve this uh, year after year. So with that, I'll pause and I'd be happy to take any questions folks have. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, we have one raised hand uh, from Mark Siegel. Sean, would you be able to unmute Mark, please? Okay, Mark, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if uh, in any of the post-row abortion referenda around the country, whether there was early voting, and if so, how did it re relate to the final vote? Yeah, thanks for the question, Mark. So, you know, in this case, you can look at, and I, I think you're referring to 2022 in that case. Um, you know, obviously, we have the referenda this year. We'll be watching those states very closely in terms of those gender gaps. We know that in states that had those constitutional amendments or ballot initiatives in 2022, you did see those big gender gaps. Again, I went to Michigan before. I'll go back there because I think that's a good example where Michigan did have a constitutional amendment on the ballot in 2022. I'm going to go back to vote share here and look at gender. And so again, we did see, um, you know, fairly substantial gender gap. And again, you look at this gender gap in Michigan 2022 among the early voters, and you might look at that and say, well, it's actually lower than it was in the presidential year. It's incredibly unusual in a midterm election to have gender gaps that are matching presidential years. So uh, you certainly did see that effect. And then we can see when you look at the final election, the final gender gap in Michigan in 2022 was actually bigger than it was in 2020. So again, the 2022 version of this had comparisons to 2018. Obviously, you know, when you're doing early vote analysis, you want to be comparing to the past like election. Um, and so it was indicative in the early vote data when we saw those bigger gender gaps that women had more energy and enthusiasm. Again, likely attributable at least partially to the constitutional amendment. I think having um, um, Governor Whitmer on the top of the ticket um, uh, obviously was a huge element of that too. Um, you know, that we can't separate from the equation. Uh, so yes. So I, I'd certainly encourage people when we think of, you know, Florida, Arizona, elsewhere, where we've got these constitutional amendments, uh, 
something we'll be looking at. Now, both of those states, the data is just beginning to come in. So we don't have, we're just beginning to get data in there where a lot of these states, it'll show up in here, but you know, half a million votes is, is not nothing. Um, but you'll see in these early states from a Florida perspective, that's almost nothing. So I'll wait a few more days before I draw any conclusions about the Florida vote. The other thing we have to be aware of is in the early days of the early vote reporting in some states, it won't be capturing the entire state. Sometimes there are counties that are reporting more slowly or not at all. So just a caution to uh, be exercised when you're looking at this information. Next, we have a submitted question. Uh, what states are you seeing as most surprising in gender gaps, election day voters moving to early other areas? Yeah, a great question. So I, I, we're really right on the leading edge of this. So I've, you know, I, I posted this early this morning. I, I have been resisting the temptation over the past couple of weeks um, to spend too much time or reading too much into the early vote data. Part of that is it's just generally early. Here we are now three weeks out and we think it's a good time to begin to dig into this information. But part of it also is just um, how different this cycle is. So the lack of a good comparison, we need to get more data into these states. So we're really just beginning to dig in now. Again, Michigan is one that stands out. Uh, Pennsylvania is another one that I've been spending time looking at for obvious reasons. Uh, but when we look at Pennsylvania, again, you see the gender gap here and you're seeing this is the final election. So let's not look at that. Um, but you're seeing gender gaps in Pennsylvania that are slightly smaller at this point than they were in 2020, uh, but still at a very high level, close to where they were in 2022. Um, again, running slightly behind um, those past benchmarks. But given what we know that, and I'll show this from a partisan registration perspective, we know again that Republicans are putting substantial effort into converting their voters uh, to uh, vote by mail. We still see a huge Democratic partisan advantage among the mail ballots that have been reported already. Again, this is just partisan registration. I want to be clear to everyone. I think we're probably likely all on the same page, but I, I need to say it out loud again. This, the, the data we have tells us who voted. It does not tell us for whom they voted. Uh, those votes are not tallied. And if they were, we would not have access to that. No one would. Uh, but you do see that you, that more Republicans or Republicans are occupying a slightly bigger share of the electorate in Pennsylvania than they did at this point in uh, 2020. Now look at this. How is that happening? Well, 37% of the, the registered, and again, this is part of, this is not model partisanship here. This is actually party registration. 37% of the registered Republicans who have voted already in Pennsylvania by mail voted on election day. So you see, they are spending their money to convert these voters. Again, is this indicative of a Republican enthusiasm advantage? No, that is an actual cannibalization of their election day vote. Uh, only 4% of their people who voted already uh, were registered and didn't vote. 2% were not registered at all. So again, you see bigger, slightly bigger numbers on the Democratic side and then smaller numbers. Democrats don't have, um, you know, they're not going in that direction. You almost certainly see more of the opposite. When all of this is said and done after election day, you'll see a larger share of Democrats who voted by mail in 2020, voting on election day in 2024. Next up, um, could you share how frequently Georgia sends updates? Uh, so they will be uh, coming in on a daily basis, I believe, and my team can correct me and we can share this information offline. But uh, uh, but I believe that every state uh, shares updates at least once a day. There are some cases where we can get updates uh, more than once a day. Um, you know, Georgia, I believe, is just beginning uh, this week. Uh, so we don't have, if we look at the data in there now, it's just, you know, a few thousand votes. Um, and again, Georgia is a great example of a state where you just have a very different scenario, where in 2020, uh, as I recall, they were mailing a ballot to every single voter that's not happening this year around. I do believe there will be interesting data in here once we get to a critical mass, which will likely be 
by the end of this week uh, for analysis. Um, but the comparison to 2020 um, will be a little bit more challenging. And that's why for me, and again, I've, 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 I've written this out in the, the public sphere, but I think it's worth reporting it, uh, repeating it here. Um, it's not enough just to compare to 2020 and, you know, one side's doing better or worse. That's not necessarily meaningful. If we start with that expectation that there are two countervailing trends that are happening, and we, we predicted this weeks ago before early voting started, we're seeing it happening basically at the levels we predicted at this point where more Republicans are voting early, more Democrats are holding off, uh, likely pivoting. So if you start with that baseline assumption, that means Republicans need to see this early vote look pretty substantially more Republican than it did at any given point in 2020. So to the extent that there are states where that is either not happening, which would be Michigan, where you know at this point it doesn't look more Republican, it actually looks more Democratic than it did at this point in 2020, I think that's a warning sign for Republicans. Or in a place like Pennsylvania, this is where it gets a little bit murkier, question of, are they moving the needle enough? Are they bringing in enough new voters? Um, it's impossible to set an exact threshold by which we can judge that. I think we'll have a similar situation in Georgia as we get that data in. Again, remembering that Georgia isn't a partisan registration state. I'll be very interested to look at the demographic data, especially the data by race and ethnicity, and to see how that plays out. Uh, can you look at specific counties with this? Uh, you can, thank you for asking that question. You can actually go even further down. So you can look at any given County in a state. Let's actually, since Georgia doesn't have, um, much here, we won't do that. But what we're going to do is go back to Michigan. We've been hearing a lot of talk in Michigan. We remember president Trump last week made disparaging comments about Detroit. Um, and so we'll look at Wayne County which is not just Detroit, obviously Detroit's a big part of it, but it's a pretty populous county. Uh, and we can look at that data broken down here in Wayne County. And so when you look at the race information, this is striking to me. And again, this is just based on very high return rates, very high uh, intensity and enthusiasm from black voters in Wayne County. Again, not just exclusively Detroit, but that's a big part of it. You see that of the ballots that have been cast so far in Wayne County, 40% of them have been cast by black voters at this point in 2022, it was just under 27%. At this point in 2020, it was just over 27%. So really radical differences here that we're seeing that is not something that you would generally expect to see. So yeah, the, the, the short answer to your question is yes, you can look at, at county, you can look at different uh, uh, districts, congressional and state legislative, and you can look at media markets. Are you seeing a surge of minority votes and are the majority women? Mm. Yeah. So again, the, the states where we've had um, substantial votes in at this point among the battlegrounds, yes, we are seeing uh, you know, for the most part, higher turnout, especially from black women, especially from older black women at this point. Uh, again, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that the early vote will skew substantially older this year than it did in 2020 uh, because of the differences from the pandemic. Uh, but yeah, we absolutely are seeing that at this point. You know, another element that I will be looking at um, more closely as we go forward in the coming days and get more data in, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're looking at turnout from black voters everywhere as a key group. Also looking at API voters, remembering back to 2020, the key role that Asian Americans played in delivering states like Georgia, uh, Nevada, and even Pennsylvania, where you have a not insignificant uh, uh, portion of, of the vote. So you see here, I'm looking at Pennsylvania from a uh, perspective of race and ethnicity, you're actually seeing increases from API voters where here, the vote share among black voters is actually somewhat down. So we're not seeing the exact same trends uh, everywhere and turnout from Hispanic voters is almost even in terms of vote share with the same point um, in 2020. Again, taking into account that Pennsylvania is clearly a state that we can see in the data Republicans have been spending money converting election day voters to vote by mail. Uh, 
Great. Next up, um, can you speak to Florida? The absentee vote numbers look good before early vote starts for Dems, whereas Virginia does not look as encouraging as past years. Any sage words on this trend, considering expanded early vote has not occurred yet in both states? Yeah, I think that's that's the big caveat, the caveat at the end. And and again, um, you know, while while we currently have the ability to break out the uh, data based on the vote mode, how someone voted in 2020, we don't have the breakouts right now in terms of 2024. That might be something that we're able to add um, in in the coming days. Uh, but that's an incredibly important part to answering these questions and looking at the analysis. We know that vote by mail uh, in 2020 skewed overwhelmingly Democratic in most states and almost every state, whereas early in person was something that from the Republican perspective was a little bit more acceptable. Right. Donald Trump didn't tell his supporters that voting early in person was fraudulent. And so that was a little bit more even a lot of states. Democrats had slight advantages. So a lot of that depends on what the mix is in these states. And we have to. Again, when we're comparing to 2020, an important context to add when you're looking at these comparisons is what was happening in that state at this point four years ago. Had they opened up early in-person voting already? Um, uh, were they mailing ballots out to everyone? And so, again, I haven't spent a lot of time digging into the Florida data yet just because it's still, even though it's a you know almost half a million votes, that's still a relatively small share of um what will end up being the the final um, early electorate. I have spent more time with Virginia. And again, you know, my conclusion at this point, Virginia obviously has had, they start early in person much earlier. They're, I think, one of the first states to do that. And you do see from a model partisanship perspective that it is closer uh, than it was at this point in 2020. Uh, or 2022. Again, the caveats being this is model partisanship, so it's a different model each year, and the model can move. Um, but also just what we've been discussing. Republicans have invest invested substantial resources in getting their people to vote early who weren't doing that before, but all indicators are at this point is they're just converting people who would have voted on election day anyhow too early vote. And again, that's not without some strategic importance. Um, as I imagine we all know, the idea of getting people up before election day is helpful to a campaign um, in general, um, but also not without its risks. So uh, again, I, I, I don't think that exactly answers your question, but when I look at the Virginia data, I'd say, you know, this partisan gap only tells part of the story. And when you actually isolate it to the infrequent voters, the first time voters, you do see Democrats have an advantage there. So I don't look at the Virginia data now and line that up with the polls that we were seeing three months ago where Republicans were claiming that they would be competitive or win uh, Virginia. Um, can you isolate mail ballots in the data? So uh, no, not at this point. Um, and, and, and so uh, you know, what I referred to just a sec second ago basically covers that. Um, we do have that in the data that our team collects. We do get almost every state, if not absolutely every state, they'll report that. Um, again, it's just something that we're looking at potentially adding to the tool. Just keeping in mind that well, our team does incredible work on this site and have done you know a lot of amazing things. The, the top priority is to our clients and the campaigns and winning elections. So to the extent that they have the bandwidth to be able to add that, that's something um, that you may see pop up on the site, the ability to actually break all of this out based on how the ballot was cast this year. It, it is an important element of understanding the vote and, and comparing across cycles. Um, so again, and if that's not something that we're able to add before election day, that's uh, almost certainly something we'll be able to add after the fact. So you'll be able to get, you know, uh, you can go to the target early dot target smart dot com at any time. The page that I started on at the beginning of this demo actually has some of the previous, we don't have all of the previous years on there, but some of the previous years. And you can actually go back and even look at the final turnout, which includes in this case for the prior years, not just um, the early vote, but the entire turnout. So in, in the case of Virginia, all 4.5 million people cast a ballot. You can look at their demographic breakdowns, that sort of thing as well. Uh, for unregistered groups, how do you model party of those who register independent? 
I hear a lot where Gen Z is registering as independent. How good is that analysis? Yeah, a very, very important um, question. Um, we've heard a lot, uh, and I think we'll continue to, though many states have registration deadlines that have just recently passed or coming soon. There are other states where people can register up to and including election day. And so we're seeing more analysis, including from our team on uh, new voter registration trends. Obviously, um, many of you joined us for our, our call on that a few weeks ago. That data set is also incredibly rich in helping us understand where the intensity and enthusiasm lies. We've heard a lot of Republicans talking about how they are registering more voters in key states, especially Pennsylvania, North Carolina, to some extent, Florida, though not something we're including in the battlegrounds. And what is misleading, I think to the the point of the person who asked the question is where we're actually seeing the biggest increases is in unaffiliated voters. And, you know, part of that is just structural in some cases, states like Nevada that have automatic voter registration that they've implemented in the last um, uh, few years where you are automatically registered as an unaffiliated and you actually have to change it if you want to uh, register as a Democrat or a Republican. But a big part of that is, uh, what the question alluded to that we're seeing a lot of Gen Z voters are registering. They're just more likely to register as unaffiliated. Um, we have the voter registration dashboard, which if you on targetsmart.com, you can access that dashboard that is public as well. That allows you to look at new voter registration, similar to this, breaking down what we're seeing in trends in new voter registration to the same period in time in the last two election cycles. And if you pick a state like Pennsylvania or North Carolina, what you'll see is, number one, that a larger share of new registrants are unaffiliated than in either of the previous two cycles. And that when you zoom in on those unaffiliated, because the tool allows you to select just to those voters and look at, uh, learn more about them, you'll see that they are younger and they're more likely to be people of color. Um, and so then it raises the question of, well, what's the impact of that? Is that a sign of those voters moving away from the Democratic Party? And, you know, while the polling data has been somewhat mixed on that, when you look at the polls, like the Harvard IOP poll, those polls that are looking exclusively at that group, it's not a subgroup of 70 people they spoke with, but it's literally multiple thousands of those individuals. Uh, you're not seeing that. You're actually seeing the Gen Z is still overwhelmingly uh, Democratic. And so, all of that to say, when we think of that in the context of this early vote dashboard, that's something else that we'll have to take into account. And the modeled partisanship, generally the party model will pick that up um, uh, because the, the party model relies on large, very large um, sample surveys, much larger than any poll you would see nationally. And so if you look here in Pennsylvania, we see these numbers in terms of registered partisanship and i don't know and this is we're doing this live so we'll see what it shows but it's plus 46 uh in terms of um registered party but you see when you look at model partisanship unaffiliated goes way down the dumb number goes up 72.7 so it's able to sort of parse that out i don't believe we have enough votes in north that uh, we do have enough in north carolina you could look at the same in north carolina where you have party registration um, so you see something very similar here in terms of party registration, it's plus 10.5 democratic, which is actually just eyeballing this, um, not bad. Um, but then in terms of model partisanship, it actually goes up to plus 14 democratic because of exactly what, um, uh, the person who asked the question is getting at, I believe we can actually look at these unaffiliated voters and we can see racial breakdowns and yeah, that's all in there. So, uh, but yeah, very important part of this analysis is better understanding unaffiliated voters. I think it's something, frankly, that the public polls might generally be the source of volatility. And some of these public polls where you are seeing uh, volatility is the difficulty in having a stable representative sample of unaffiliated voters, given that we know there are core Republicans and core Democrats hiding out among the unaffiliated. 
Next up, can you provide insight comparing Republicans versus Democrats, new voter registrations across all demographics in some key states like Arizona and Pennsylvania, for example? Yeah. So that's another one I would just I, I'd recommend folks uh, if, if you go to the voter registration dashboard, it's built exactly for that. So if you go to targetsmart.com, it should be linked from the home page. Or if you don't see it there, there's an insight section and it'll be prominently featured there. I encourage you to go there. It'll allow you to look at any individual state. It'll allow you to look at the new registrations, you know, keeping in mind the trends that we've been reporting on here. Um, you, you see these big increases after July 21, when Vice President Harris uh, became the nominee, was endorsed by President Biden. Uh, big increases in registration rates among younger voters, women voters, uh, and voters of color. Overwhelming increases among young women of color. You saw secondary spikes around the convention, the presidential debate, the Taylor Swift post, and then National Voter Registration Day, all creating their own spikes. So you can track those. Now, we have to keep in mind, new voter registration stats don't come in like early vote data in that they, they aren't coming in real time. Early vote data is coming on a daily basis. We get a list of these are the people who cast a ballot in this state in the previous day, whereas new voter registration data just takes a little bit longer. So on that site, you'll see there are updates there, but it's going to lag generally by a, you know, a couple or a few weeks, depending on the state and how quickly the state updates their file. Okay, Tom, and being mindful of time, I think we um, have time for one more question. So just a couple of specifics. Um, is that does the absentee category equal mail-in ballots, and does the data include overseas expats and military votes? Mm. Yeah, great questions. So, um, I, and I will say this gets confusing when we talk about these things online because the lingo is not always consistent. So, broadly, when we are talking about in the context of this site, and generally, if you see something that I'm writing out there, though I I try to be more clear about this, but often fail. When we're talking about early votes, it's generally just talking about any vote. Um, before they're cast before election day. Obviously here we refer to early in absentee vote report. So absentee generally is going to be referring to votes that were cast by mail. Again, there are some caveats we know in places like Pennsylvania and other places now um, you can get a mail ballot and cast, or you can actually go into your election office, apply for a mail ballot, get your mail ballot, cast your mail ballot in that office at the same time. So that is effectively early in person voting, but they're technically cast in a mail ballot. I don't mean to make this more confusing than it needs to be. For me, it's a little bit easier just to refer to it all as early voting. Votes cast early, meaning before uh, election day. But this does include any votes that were cast before election day are going to be included in this dashboard. Um, the question of the overseas ballots, again, no two states or what I'll say is not all 50 states plus the District of Columbia are going to do it exactly the same way in terms of what they report, how they report, when they report it. Uh, but generally, yes, uh, they're just giving a list of people who voted regardless of where they live, whether they're overseas or not. With the caveat that we know that the overseas ballots are going to take longer and that in many states, you will see more of those coming in even after Election Day. That's the other thing that we have to keep in mind is um, that this is reflecting the votes are reported in terms of the people who the states have reported as having cast their ballot. They've checked them off. This ballot came in. Um, but that will continue. We know that some states or every state has some deadline in terms of after which ballots won't be accepted. But we do know that the count that you see right before election day on the site won't necessarily be indicative, or it certainly won't be indicative of all the the pre-election, it'll be the overwhelming majority of them, but, but some, this site will actually continue to update in the few days uh, after election day. And, and with that, I know we're wrapping up. And again, I appreciate you all for joining us. Um, if you have follow-up questions, please send them our way. Um, we will be sending out additional updates on a, a fairly regular basis in the closing weeks here. We won't be doing this on a daily basis. Again, we encourage people to use the tool um, but we will be continuing to share our insights um, as is warranted, as we see the data begin to populate more and we see interesting trends. We'll be sharing them. Uh, make sure you are on our mailing list. We'll be sharing them on the insights page that you can see here linked at the top. 
Um, and of course, I'll continue to share insights on uh, Twitter and threads. Great. Thank you, Tom. And thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, y'all.